Good morning, everybody. This is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We have been working our way through an explication of the FINRA Series 7 content outline. Uh, I highly recommend that you go to the FINRA website, you print this PDF, and I would use it. And the explications we've been doing is kind of an intellectual inventory of where you're at. You know, the test writing committee gets together and decides there are four critical functions to being a broker. And we've already expl explicated critical function one, where a baby broker, term of endearment, not a derogatory term, it's just a new broker, seeks business for the broker dealer, customers and potential customers. We've uh, explicated question, uh, critical function two, which is that opening opens accounts after obtaining and evaluating customers' financial profile investment objectives. So. There was nine questions found in that first explication and 11 questions found in that set second critical function. Uh, today, we're getting started on critical function three. And uh, let me get my annotation tool out here for us. And critical function three is really important, right, to your success. Uh, please note, 91 questions there, 91 questions. Now, this one I'm going to break up. We're going to do a little differently. Excuse me, let me get, take care of that for us. We're gonna do it a little differently than we've done the previous two. You find critical function one, the explication there in the front of your series seven playlist. So on the YouTube channel, you find your series. For example, this is series seven. And then that playlist contains all the lectures for that, uh, whatever that series is, today's series seven. And I put the first uh, content outline, the introduction there as the first thing for people to watch. And then I put the critical function two right after critical function one. Now in critical function three with 91 questions, we're gonna do a little bit different. Of critical function three, the most important is 3.3. I'm gonna show that to you in a minute. And what I'm gonna do here is go through each of the uh, investment vehicles found on uh, critical function three, particularly 3.3 by subject area. And when I explicate that subject area, I'm gonna put it in the playlist for that particular uh, subject. So for example, if I do munis, it'll be with munis lectures in that area where you find that. And again, we're not gonna be lecturing the stuff over again. So let's go look and see what critical function uh, three looks like. Let me clean up the slide. Oh. And so well, like I said, we've done one, we've done two. And so now today we're gonna be looking into critical function three. And we're gonna chunk this up. We're not gonna go through 91 questions. I'm trying to keep these explications somewhere in the 30 minute range. So let me make a note of where we're at time-wise, just so we can see where we're at. And like I said, we're not gonna get through all of this critical function today, but we'll, we'll piece it out. And so here is critical function three, 91 questions. As a broker, you know, the critical function, the most important critical function is providing customers with information about their investments. We make recommendations. This is suitability, right, of the investments. Uh, that's the vast majority of those 91 questions. A very small portion of uh, critical function three is that we transfer assets and we maintain, maintain appropriate records. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna chunk this out. I'm not gonna be doing 3.1 with you today, explicating that, I will do that at some point. I'm not gonna do 3.2 with you today. Where I wanna get started is where we have the vast majority of our questions, which is in a three point, uh, well, it's gonna be 3.2, right? That's where we find the vast majority of these questions. 3.2, right? Where we review, we analyze customers' investment profiles and keyword product options, investment vehicles. That is the most uh, target rich environment for you on your test. Now I have a beautiful lecture on equity securities. I'll refer that to you. I have a, that includes preferred stock and rights and warrants. I also have some great lectures uh, found on mutual funds and ETFs in there. I haven't done anything on variable life. So I probably will circle back and do that because it's not, again, there's one, two questions, maybe partnerships. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explicate the options. So we're on, Critical function 3.2, we're in the investment vehicle section of the test. It is the most important uh, uh, critical function with the most uh, test questions. Now, again, I have seven, eight hours of option lectures, lecture one, two, three, and four. There's four option lectures 
uh, and this is not that. We're not going to be spending seven hours here. The explication means I'm just going to show you what you're held accountable for. And if I can give you a name and shoot point and click question, I'm going to do so. So that's kind of what the explication is about. Okay, so listed options and their characteristics, contact, tr contract specifications. You know, if you get good at contract specifications, if you get good at contract specifications, what that means is you know that a long call is a choice to buy the stock, a short call is an obligation to sell the stock at the strike price, it's all standardized. You know, if you know that a long put is a choice to sell the stock, Short put is an obligation to buy the stock and you can track money going to be in pretty good uh, shape. You know, on the contract specification, we are going to adjust those. You know, if there's a stock split and I had, you know, for Apple, for example, split four for one. So I had a 500 call. Now I got 125 call. It'll be, you know, reduced. You know, you can almost get every one of those questions with, you know, uh, more shares at a lower price. Uh, we will not adjust. We'll adjust for a certain size stock dividend, but not cash dividends. Exercise and assignment is very testable. You know, one thing we need to know is when we exercise, uh, I'll go over that with you at length, you know, whether it's American style or European style, uh, settlement date for options is T plus one. Resulting exercise in stocks is T plus two. Opening and closing transactions. Premium, the intrinsic value plus the time value. Uh, we don't worry about open interest, but that's how many contracts are out there, right? So, uh, you know, a contract with a lot of open interest is going to be more liquid than a contract without a lot of open interest. Uh, position limits that apply to the same side of the market. And then uh, exercise limits, depending on how much potential stock you can get through exercise. All right, so let's just get started on uh, some of this stuff. So uh, let's start first. Again, we're not gonna cover everything that's in the FINRA test content outline because there are things that are in the content outline that on debrief people that say they haven't seen. You know, So what we're trying to do here is give you the highlights or the overview of the kind of things you're gonna see. And so the uh, first thing we want to do here is talk about the OCC. And uh, let me get a different color here. It is very testable to know that the OCC is the issuer and guarantor of all options contracts. Now, what that means is when you're trading options, you don't have counterparty risk. You know, you say, Dean, how do I know that when I exercise an Apple call, if I'm long that call, that person's going to deliver the stock. And I said, well, how do they know you're going to deliver the money? And you don't need to worry that because the OCC stands in the middle and they make sure all the people playing are going to fulfill their obligations. Now, the two styles of exercise we have, the two styles of exercise we have are American style, as you recall, very testable, which means you can exercise anytime. Oop, let me get my different color here. Where you can exercise anytime. And that's one of the risks you have, you're short in equity options, right? Any person, anytime the person as long as want to, they can exercise you. And that is typical, I would know that is typical of equity option contracts. Uh, by the way, if you exercise the equity option contract, the option itself is T plus one in terms of settlement but the resulting stock trade, please note stock trade, you can't deliver the money, you gotta deliver the stock. So if I'm short a call, I'm gonna to have to deliver the stock. You know, and the person who's long the call has to deliver the money. You know, if I'm long put and I exercise, I'm gonna put the stock to somebody, they're gonna give me the money. The resulting stock trade is T plus two. T plus two, and then remember European style is typical of non-equity options. And last trading day, you know, expiration, no real testable distinction there. And that's for uh, non-equity options. So, you know, I don't have any risk that somebody's gonna make me uh, come up with the, the money or stock until the end. At that point, I might have a problem in terms of short. You know, if you've watched my lectures, I think of the person who's short, uh, the person short is a potential victim, is a potential victim. Now, the uh, we're looking at this first part of the explication here, listed options and their characteristics. 
and we're looking at uh, adjustments, exercise, assignment, settlement date. So uh, the other thing you should know is that index options are T plus one and the resulting exercise is T plus one as well. You know, we say they settle in cash, not physical delivery. So if I'm short an index option, I get exercised. I don't deliver the underlying index, thank God, because then nobody would play. What I deliver is what the uh, cash value of the intrinsic value is, uh, is also T plus one. Now, the way we express that sometimes is a test term. Let me get a different color here. Is the way we express that as a test term is, uh, you know, maybe choice A says, well, give me uh, choice A says T plus one, T plus two. And choice B here on options, uh, indexes says choice B is T plus one, T plus one. And then again, depending on what they're asking you would depend on the uh, appropriate response. Uh, opening transactions and closing transactions, opening and closing transactions. So uh, the two opening transactions are, we have opening purchases which are used to establish or add to a, a long position. And we have opening sales, which are used to establish or add to a short position. And then remember, there's three things that can happen in an option. The option can be traded, and that's what we're talking about now. It can be exercised or it can expire. And if we are going to trade the option, we're gonna do what's called the offsetting transaction. Now let me get a different color here. So offsetting means you're gonna sell the contract or you're gonna buy back the contract. So offsetting the offset uh, trade to an opening purchase is gonna be a closing sale. And I'm putting in parentheses here because you could end up being doing more than one contract. So, you know, closing sale is used to eliminate or reduce a long position and a closing purchase or purchases because, you know, we could have more than one contract is uh, used to eliminate or reduce a short position. Uh, so we're uh, explaining this first part here. It says listed options, their characteristics, uh, adjustments, dividends, assignment, settlement date, opening and closing transactions. Uh, remember the intrinsic value plus the time value always be equals the premium. Now on the test, the more important thing for us is going to be intrinsic value. Uh, because you know options are a wasting asset. You know, I always joke you're going to trade options in my firm. I'd make you write a thousand times. Options are a wasting asset. Time value erodes. At expiration, a contract is only worth its intrinsic value. If it has no intrinsic value, the contract will expire worthless. If it has intrinsic value, the contract will be uh, exercised. So that's going to be most important. Time value is going to disappear as we, you know, uh, as time goes on. Again, we're explicating this first uh, section here. Uh, position limits apply to the same side of the market. You know, we don't want the, the tail wagging the dog. You know, so the position limits are to make sure that we don't have the options mark and driving the stock market. And so what you need to know about position limits, not you don't need to memorize position limits because they'll say assuming position limits are, if you get this question, very rare to get it. But you should definitely know what is the same side of the options market. The same side, because that, that's what they apply to. They apply to the same side of the market. And it would be for the uh, the class. 
the class would be the type plus the stock. So we're talking about position limits and that is called the class. So Apple calls is a class, Apple puts is a class. And again, as we said, we don't want the Apple option contracts driving the stock market. And so you can get tested on what's called the buy side of the options market, also known as, let's put AKA, the bullish side. And for, uh, uh, for that, the answer would be long calls and short puts. Right in my example with Apple, if you're long the calls, you have a choice to buy the Apple. And if you're short the put, you have an obligation to buy the Apple. And so that would be the same side and Apple calls, Apple puts is a class, right? Apple calls is the type plus the stock and it applies that. Uh, that. And then if they ask you about the sell side, let's get a different color here or bearish side of the options market. Let's do that, boom. The sell side, now we're not talking about the option, we're talking about the underlying stock, right? Not buying or selling the option. We're talking about its relationship to the stock. And if I ask you that, remember, that would be short calls. That's an obligation to sell the Apple and long puts. That would be an obligation to, a uh, choice to sell the Apple, right? So that's positional. Let's just see where we're at in this explication here. Uh, we've talked about opening and closing transactions. We talked about the premium equaling the intrinsic and the time value. Open interest, we said how many contracts are out there in the marketplace. We've talked about position limits and then there would be exercise limits too in terms of the same thing. It applies to those position limits. All right, uh, leaps, leaps. You don't need to know that a LEAP stands for a long-term equity appreciation potential security. No, you know, LEAPs technically uh, go out to 39 months. Let me get a different color here. In practice, they go out to uh, 30 months. And, you know, here's the idea. I mean, if you want me to obligate myself to deliver Apple short call for you know two and a half years, I'm gonna want some big time money. Now, how would I test you on a leap? There's a couple ways I might test you on a leap. Remember, you to qualify for a long-term capital gain, you've got to be able to uh, hold a uh, investment for more than 12 months. And so a leap is the only option position that may qualify for long-term capital gains. That's one way I could test you about a leap because all the other option contracts you know expired before then. You know, another way I could test you on a leap is uh, give you the same strike price on a call or put and ask you based on the same strike, but missing expirations, which one is most likely a leap. And remember longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. And so that'd be another way I could test you and say, which one of these is most likely a leap and you look at the greater premium. Longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. Uh, basic strategies. You're held accountable for nine option strategies. And as I uh, mentioned, we have over, you know, seven hours, more like eight hours of lectures. And what I'm explicating right now, I've been at this about 15 minutes. I just want to warn you again, the explications are not lectures. Explications are more about an intellectual inventory. So you kind of know what you're held accountable for. Are there some aim and shoot point and click uh, performance opportunities, test questions in here for you to pick up a point or two? Most certainly there is. Uh, but I like to think of it as there's nine strategies you're held accountable for. One of those is a covered call. One is how to hedge equity or indexes. You know, if I have a, a portfolio and I'm worried about my entire stock portfolio going down, you know, why would I want to buy a put on each and every one of my uh, stocks? What I'd be worried about is systematic risk, risk in the system, the tendency of securities prices to move together. So that's what I'm worried about because, you know, if it's selection risk, non-systemic risk, I would just buy a put on the particular stock I'm worried about. But if it's, you know, systematic risk, I'd buy a puts on the index that most closely approximates my portfolio, right? So we could use index options just like we would any other type of thing. Or we could just speculate on a market direction using uh, index options. Uh, foreign currency. You know, the underlying remember is the index or the foreign currency or the stock and the foreign currency. I can use foreign currencies to speculate right? Or I can use them to hedge, right? Those are strategies available to me. Uh, yield-based options. I would know that yield-based options 
uh, yield based options. have a direct relationship with interest rates. Let me get a different color here. So yield-based options have a direct relationship to interest rates. So, you know, what I mean by that is if you think uh, interest rates are going up, buy a call, think interest rates are going down, uh, buy a put, and you could use those for the same thing. Uh, you know, they have a direct relationship uh, with uh, interest rates. All right, so a protective put uh, for equities. Why do you do that? So again, I'm not going to start doing going over the nine strategies, which I do in seven hours of lecture. What I am going to do you, do is tell you why you do it, and then, you know, you can reverse engineer when I'm going to go over suitability, right? So when I buy a protective put on my stock, or I buy protective uh, puts on the index because I'm worried about systematic risk, what I'm establishing is the ability, let me get a different color again. I'm establishing the ability to participate in a big price increase, but not participate in a big price decline. Not participate in a big price decline. So what I'm hoping is you know whatever I lose in my particular stock, I make up in the intrinsic value of my put or what I'm making, uh, you know, uh, losing in my stock portfolio, my index puts are becoming more valuable. And so I could do that. Now, kind of a interesting, another thing I could do here, let me get a different color, is I could also, uh, to hedge this portfolio, I could also use a uh, option on the VIX. The VIX is the volatility index and that too would have a direct relationship Meaning, you know, if I thought the markets were going down, I'd buy a call, uh, VIX call, and the call would go up. You know, VIX is volatility. Usually when people are, not testable, but when the people are more fearful, they're willing to pay more for puts. And what the VIX basically does is compare the premiums and they go, okay, well, people are, the premiums for puts are more, people are getting fearful. Sometimes we call it the, you know, the fear gauge or fear index. And uh, we could use VIX options as well. Uh, covered calls. We do to generate additional income, supplement dividend inco income. That's the phraseology you'd be looking for on the test in terms of, oh, I don't know why me. I always like to put the, the thing I'm writing on the screen. I try and put a different color so you can tell what is, you know, FINRA's document and what is Dean's explication of that. Uh, so cover call and uh, put writing, you know, put writing is going to bring in some income, but you know, the, the one you get cussed on is the covered call it drives me nuts because covered calls are pretty mellow, right? Why not agree to sell high stock? You just buy low. Some will be hundreds of dollars in advance for agreeing to do so. Uh, you know, a lot of people do that. Now put writing uh, also brings in income, but you know, if you're using put writing against your short stock position, you still are exposed to unlimited risk. So, you know, um, uh, covered call is the one you should spend some time on. The vast majority of the strategy questions, by the way, uh, uh, come from uh, the basics and the covered call, right? Uh, advanced strategies, I like to call them multiple option strategies, but you know, uh, let's see if I got a different color here. You know, a debit spread, you know, not testable again, not testable. But you know, in all of these speculative option strategies, you're either buying volatility or you're selling volatility. You're buying upward, upward volatility, directional volatility, or you're buying downward uh, volatility. So if you're long a call, you're buying upward volatility in the stock, the underlying. If you're buying a put, you're buying downward volatility. You know, you're basically, when you buy an options, are making a, a speculation on three things as a buyer, direction, how far, and timing. You know, and the seller of that is willing to take that. They're selling the volatility. They're saying, okay, Listen, you may be right about direction. You may be right about how far and you might be right about timing. I don't think you're gonna get the trifecta. I don't think you're gonna get all of them right. And so I'm here for you. So we have two types of debit spreads. In a debit spread, you're buying the volatility and it, like any option strategy, when you buy the strategy, when you buy the option contract, or in this case contracts, the maximum risk is gonna be what you pay. You know, so in a debit spread, uh, max loss, 
is the debit. You know, the way we get debit or credit, again, I'm not lecturing this. I've got a two hour lecture on, uh, on advanced option strategies. This is just an explication of options. So again, I'm warning you that this is not, this isn't something you can read the morning of and you're gonna pass your exam, right? This isn't a quick, sheet, quick, quick facts or quick sheet or, you know, crunch time facts. That's not what this is, right? But anyways, the debit spread, the max loss is the debit. And, uh, you know, we have two versions of this. We have a uh, debit call spread. And what I'm doing in a debit call spread, and both spreads, by the way, in debit spreads, what I'm doing is lowering my out-of-pocket cost. That's bueno. By lowering my out-of-pocket cost, I'm lowering my risk. That's bueno. That's good. And I'm also drawing the break even closer to me. I'm going to need less volatility to cover my out-of-pocket cost. But debit call spreads are bullish. And uh, debit put spreads... are bearish. And then remember, we also have credit spread. So here, you know, I'm smart enough to know that if I just sell a naked call, oh my goodness, you know, I'd have unlimited risk. So on a credit call spread, I'm a smart person. I say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take some of my money. Well, let's first just put in credit spreads. Your max gain is the premium. And uh, we have two versions of it. We have a credit call spread and a credit call spread. Um, you are bearish. Let's put that in there. Wait, wait, yeah, bearish. You know, what you hope is the contracts expire and for that to happen, the stock goes down. And then we have a credit put spread. This, which are bullish. Again, I would for you to lecture to, you know, if you want to go more into that, more in depth into that. Uh, straddle uh, combinations. A combination is just a straddle uh, with different strike prices, just a straddle with different strike prices. And again, I said all these uh, 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 speculative strategy, all these speculative strategies. All these speculative strategies you're either buying or selling volatility. And so in the straddle category, we can either straddle a stock or we can straddle an index. Or we can you know, have different uh, stuff on there. But when we're doing a straddle, we have two versions. We have long straddles and we have short straddles. And then remember we have straddles with different strike prices called combinations. Let me get a different color. So long straddles and short straddles. And so, you know, straddles are pretty straightforward as a test issue. You know, what you gotta be able to do on your exam is identify a straddle. You gotta be able to calculate the break evens. You gotta be able to determine where the straddle is profitable. You know, we have a great mnemonic for that. Uh, the Monica silo. That stands for short inside, long outside. And then uh, when do you use a straddle? And you either are buying the volatility, you know, you're thinking the stock is going to move, but you're not sure whether it's up or down. So you buy the straddle or you say it's going to stay within the trading range. You know, now that I did that, I kind of think, well, maybe I should go back and uh, maybe uh, put in a text box and just tell you what it is you're going to have to do on a, a spread as well. You have to identify a spread. You have to uh, determine whether it's a credit spread or a debit spread. You have to determine whether you want the contracts to expire or whether you want the contracts to be exercised. You have to determine whether you want the difference in the premiums to get smaller or whether you want them to get uh, bigger, widen. And then you have to be able to figure out uh, max gain. 
uh, max loss. And you got to be able to do break even. And we got two uh, great things for that. We got Cal, that stands for call, add to the lower if it's a call spread. And we've got, let me move this up. Just put it over here. Or push, and that stands for push, subtract from the higher. And then the last thing we got to be able to do on the exam is uh, determine uh, whether the spread is bullish or bearish. And the way we do that is the larger premium dominates the position. So again, I am uh, not lecturing options here. I'm not lecturing options. I'm just telling you what is the intellectual inventory, the things you need to be able to do, right? looks like I got a typo there. Uh, you know, you can always know credit expire narrow goes together all the time. Debit exercise widen goes together all the time. Please refer to my two hour lecture on multiple option strategies. Um, Okay, so back to what we're doing here, back to what we're doing here is we're explicating this thing. Uh, naked option, naked call is very testable. Oop, let me get rid of that. Uh, naked call is very testable. Naked means you don't have the stock. So you're agreeing to sell stock you don't own. So let's put that in there, let's get a different color. Uh, naked or uncovered is agreeing to sell stock you don't own. And that is a guaranteed test question on your uh, exam and that has unlimited risk. So if I come into your office, I say, I want to lose so much money that you in advance, you know, can't tell me how much, you know, uh, that would be the thing that would do it, right? Uh, naked or uncovered call. Now, when you are writing a naked put, that's, you know, dangerous too. Naked put just means you're obliging yourself to buy the stock and you don't have cash equal to the aggregate exercise price. You know, that's that's bad too, but it's not as, uh, you know, it, bad because it's definable, right? So here it says uncovered naked call or put writing and a naked put, not so bad because the max loss is definable. It's the break even to uh, zero. Yeah, so that's not as bad a deal. There's a margin clerk. I'm still going to want to talk to you about that. You know, break evens, profit and loss. Uh, break evens, we have, remember for calls, we have a call up and for, let's put basics here. So in basics option uh, positions, there are four of them. It's going to be, uh, let's do our first one. But we'll just do calls because it's uh, you know it's the same strike price plus premium for calls equals break even and then remember if you're long the call you want it above that if you're uh, short uh, you want it below that and for uh, puts you know, it's going to be strike price less premium. equals the break even and that's for puts. And then again, remember, it doesn't matter where you want to do that. You know, some people have charts. I have what I call the options matrix. Other people call it the beauty chart. Some people call it home base, whatever, you know, matrix, whatever you're using uh, for that. Remember, you got to know the break even, you got to know where you want the stock in relationship to that. And so, you know, we have uh, those four basic option positions. Let's put that there. And then, you know, we have a uh, stock plus options, stock plus options. And for the covered call, it's the one time and the one time only that the break even is going to be the stock cost uh, less the premium. So, you know, what I paid for the stock less what I brought in for the option. I'm reducing my, uh, you know, my out-of-pocket cost. And then remember we have a protective put, a put that's protecting a stock position and the break even there is going to be the stock cost, stock cost uh, plus the premium. So that's the one time. So one of the things, you know, people sometimes either get the speculative and not the hedges or the hedges, not the speculative. 
you know, a covered call is the one time I have a call and it's not up. A covered call, it's what I paid for the stock, less what I brought in for the option. Again, I would refer you to an hour plus lecture I have on just these hedged positions, right? And then, uh, you know, the other one we have in terms of uh, our, um, our uh, hedges is short stock. I don't think there you're going to have to do the break even. You're just going to have to know that whatever, you know, you do when you buy a call on your short stock position, you no longer have unlimited risk, but it would be the short stock. And then I would subtract whatever I paid for the premium. So, you know, and we also have uh, straddles and the straddle, the break even, there's going to be two. It's going to be strike price plus total premium gives me the upside break even. And strike price minus the premiums, uh, total premiums gives me the uh, downside break even. Uh, let's see, what else we got? We got uh, spreads. And spreads, we have call add to the lower. So we get the break even. And a call spread, we're going to add to the lower strike. Call add to the lower. So it's going to be the lower strike price. XP means strike price uh, plus, or my, in this case, what? It doesn't matter, by the way, people get hung up on this. It doesn't matter whether it's a debit or credit to get the break even. It's, you know, the absolute value, if you will. So it's the lower strike plus the net premium equals the break even. And uh, push, subtract from the higher. So I'm gonna put, we're gonna subtract the higher price. That's our mnemonics for that. And do, 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 do. You know, one of the requested lectures that somebody has outstanding and I'm fulfilling that request is all the stock math, addition, subtraction, division, and you know, I'll put it in there. But just to get by way of reminder, this is all found in over, you know, close to eight hours uh, I haven't actually counted, but I'm sure it's pretty close to eight hours of lecture on all the options. And, you know, my candidates do pretty well on options. I've had, when they back in the days they gave scores, I had people getting 100% on options. So you're going to get about 20 of them, right? So, you know, it's a place you want to spend some time. Anyways, put subtract from higher. So I'm going to take the higher strike, call up, put down also works here, right? And I'm going to subtract. Again, it doesn't matter where it's a debit or credit, whatever that net number is. You know, the way I think it is the absolute value equals the break even there. Uh, tax treatment, as I said, all options trading is short term with the exception of a leap. So, um, you know, if you if get exercise, so let's just, uh, let's make sure we get this. T, T, you know, T's a great mnemonic. So the option can be traded, the option can be exercised, or the option can expire. That's what can happen to an option contract. I'm not asking what can happen to players. I'm asking what can happen to an option contract. And trading is pretty easy. It's all short term, except for a leap, a leap. So you just net the numbers and whatever it is. Trading is all short term with the possible exception, because even a leap could just be short term, how long you had it. But trading uh, is all short term. And uh, expire would be, that's good news or bad news, right? It's good news if you sold it, bad news if you bought it but expires is short term with the possible exception of a leap. Again, I wouldn't worry about that. And then, you know, if you exercise the option or get exercised, that would follow a break even. So exercise follows break even. So, you know, whatever, if you're taking your test and they say, what's the cost base and you just do the break even, you're going to be fine. Let me just give you an example. So, you know, I buy uh, one Apple uh, May, 125 call at six and I, I exercise that contract, right? So that means I bought the stock for 125, I paid six to do so. My break even is 131 and so is the cost base. So if you just remember that 99% of the time uh, you would be right in that is the cost base, so is the cost base. All right, so as you can see here, we've got other subject areas we're going to explicate, but I just want to show you where we're at. We've just explicated the uh, options section here, uh, the options uh, section, 
And we said last trading day, I just clean that up at expiration. And let's see, uh, so that's what we've uh, talked about today. Let's just tie that back to where we're at in the critical functions that we're explicating. I look like I came in about 40 minutes on this part of the explication. That's why I chunked it up here on this, this third section, because as you can see at the third section, 91 questions, you know, I'd be here five or six hours. If you were in a three or four day series seven class with me, you know, that we'd be spending, you know, almost an entire day on options. And we just spent about 40 minutes, I think. Uh, but anyways, we're uh, explicating currently uh, the FINRA Series 7 content outline, and we're uh, in critical function three, and there is critical function three. So what I'm going to do is, this one's going to be a little different. So just so you know, if you're watching, well, you wouldn't be able to do that if you're watching this. Uh, the way we work our, our YouTube channel, just so you know, if this is your first time uh, joining us, I'm going to set this for premiere. It will premiere, and when the uh, premieres, you're going to be, if you're watching on the premiere, this will make no sense to you, but it will for the next explication, right? Uh, and then I'll tell you when it premieres. And when it premieres, I run a live chat alongside the lecture uh, as it premieres, and I can, you know, I'm there to answer any questions about the explication or any other, you know, FINRA or NASA questions you have. So that's a time for us to get together in person and uh, talk. So I'm probably going to set the premiere for this one. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. And uh, obviously, uh, you'll be with me if you're going to join me for the premiere. Uh, thanks for being here with me, because that's when this will be, be happening. All right, so uh, uh, we'll continue to explicate. I'm going to probably, I'm probably going to explicate a critical function three with by waiting, right? And then I'll put it back in order. And then as I mentioned, these explications, I'm not going to put uh, in the front of the playlist, I'm going to put them in the uh, you know the beginning of whatever subject area. So in the uh, playlist, we have options. So I'm going to put this in front of the options lecture, and then you know maybe you get an overview of what those lectures are trying to accomplish. So that's my game plan. Uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, please like. Uh, you can always put any comments you have in the comment box. I'm pretty good at responding if you have questions, or you can put it in the discussion on the YouTube channel. Or we have a subreddit community called r uh, hashtag or hashtag backslash, excuse me, Series 7. I'm the moderator there. I'm Series 7 Guru. If you want to join us there, there's another community and another place to get some answers. So I uh, hope you are finding these productive. I've had some people, I wasn't sure if they were, but I've had people say they are. And so we'll continue to get this explication. I've started this on the SIE and I've started on some other exams where I plan on doing it on all the, each of the exams. So seven first, then probably SIE, and then I got to get something up for my 66 folks. So I'm going to probably do some explication work on 66 uh, next week. Thank you.